the Tennessee Central Railway had a very hard life. It was underfunded, undersupported politically, but there was much potential there with the natural resources in the Upper Cumberland, being lumber, coal, livestock, so forth. Generations of families worked for the Tennessee Central. It was a good place to work back in the day. Anybody that was looking for a job, I would highly recommend the Tennessee Central. They were like any other railroad. They did their best, but as an employee, you always see things that they could do to improve it. I started working on the Tennessee Center September the 4th, 1917. Worked to November the 12th, 1955. Some of these days were pleasant. Some were sad. Some were easy and others hard. Railroading was dangerous. But I liked it. Railroad arrived in the United States in 1827. In less than 10 years time they proved themselves able to move more freight and passengers more efficiently than the horse, stagecoach, and canal. Those who saw the potential in this new form of transportation greatly benefited as miles of iron rails spread out between cities. For other parts of the country the revolution was slow in coming. In the Appalachian city of Knoxville, Tennessee, a convention was held in 1836 to discuss the railroad's impact in the state. The possibility of a rail line from Knoxville to the state capital of Nashville was raised for the first time. Railroads held an advantage in East Tennessee, where the rocky, uneven land of the Cumberland Plateau made rivers into creeks and small ravines. While economic centers were connected by rail faster than water, going by land in Middle Tennessee meant going up against the weather, wild animals, Native American attacks, and raids from highwaymen. Therefore, most of the region's commerce flowed along the rivers by steamboat, matching the time taken to journey by land on foot or horseback. The journey took days at a time, capacity was limited, but was cheap and dependable. It wouldn't be until February 11, 1854 when Nashville's first train arrived from Chattanooga. In just a few decades, a total of five railroads radiated from the fledgling metropolis, connecting various cities and ports throughout the southeast. Chattanooga, Atlanta, Birmingham, Memphis, and Louisville. The only spoke missing was Knoxville with vast isolated lumber and coal seams situated within the Cumberland Plateau. There were visionaries back then that uh, saw the potential, that saw uh, coal mining, saw lumber, and uh, were able to, had the money and was able to uh, open businesses like the railroad, like the mines, like the lumber companies, uh, I guess like the Vanderbilts did with Nashville and the railroads. The largest seam of block coal in the United States was located in Overton County. With no rail lines though, there was no way to send the coal to towns for heating, iron rolling mills to power furnaces, or to fledgling power stations to bring electricity to civilization. Two railroads had tried connecting this region with the outside world. The Tennessee and Pacific was chartered in 1866 with the ambition of carrying coal from the Cumberland Plateau to Nashville, Memphis, and Jackson, Mississippi. Their first segment of track opened in 1871 between Nashville and Lebanon and never turned a profit, falling into receivership after just six years. 
On March 8, 1884, the second attempt was chartered as the Nashville and Knoxville Railroad Company. This line would be on solid financial footing thanks to its founder, Alexander Crawford, an iron ore industrialist from Newcastle, Pennsylvania. As the owner of five railroads feeding his iron ore rolling mills in the Mahoing Valley, he saw the potential in coal mining around the towns of Sanding Stone and Rockwood and established the rail length to transport coal to his rolling mills in the northeast. His railroad began at the Tennessee and Pacific's old railhead in Lebanon, its route connecting some of the most far-flung settlements in the Highland Rim. The railroad's first spade of dirt was thrown by Wilson L. Waters, who encouraged the railroad to serve the town he resided in. In the beginning, the settlement consisted of Waters' own farm, a post office, sawmill, grist mill, and blacksmith shop. Following the depot's construction in 1885, passenger and freight traffic doubled the population of Watertown. The rail spread eastward to Gordonsville, where a branch line began bringing passengers to South Carthage in 1888. The main line would curve off into the first of many geographical barriers. Here among the cliffs of Sebawisha, with towering rock on one side and the Canny Fork River on the other, track crews had to chisel the roadbed with simple hand tools. There were also no ballast and tie plates to better hold the track together. The crude work would be perfected as soon as more revenue could be gained. Following this test of tight clearances, the test of mountain climbing would begin with the crossing of the Canny Fork River. Despite the federal law's insistence on building a drawbridge for steamboats still plying the river, it was only opened for boats three times in its whole service life, before being replaced by a fixed truss bridge. From this bridge, situated at 500 feet above sea level, the Cumberland Plateau lay ahead. For every 100 feet, the tracks gained a foot in elevation in a 1% grade. The steepest portion of the grade is at Silver Point Hill, where the grade is 3%. To lift a heavy train up such a steep slope, the easiest solution would be to add another locomotive in front or behind for more pulling power. But in most cases, trains had to double the hill. At the bottom of the grade in Buffalo Valley, part of the train was uncoupled and pulled by the locomotive to the top of the hill. Upon reaching the summit at Silver Point, the train's first section would be left in a siding. The locomotive then ran light down the hill to get the rest of the train. The whole consist would be put back together at the summit, from where the train would continue. While this method broke the train down into manageable segments for the climb up the Cumberland Plateau, it was very time extensive and would prove to be a bottleneck on the eastern division of the railroad for years to come. Reprieve would be at hand for the track layers on the top of the plateau, which leveled out at over 1,000 feet above sea level. With the completion of the Canny Fork drawbridge, the first train paraded into Cookville on July 10, 1890. Livestock and general goods were the main commodities in this region, which could now be shipped anywhere in the country via rail. Sadly, missing from the celebration was the creator himself. Alexander Crawford passed away the previous April, leaving his eldest son Andrew to run the railroad. Taking up as much slack as he could, Andrew saw how traffic was dependent on business relations with their mainline connection in Lebanon, which operated their one and only route to Nashville. He made a pitch to gain access to the city with funding provided by a city election, which was not approved. The Nashville extension was not of great concern, though. A year into his presidency, Andrew was forced to take out loans just to keep the trains running. Some track improvements were made, but unprofitability plagued the line and overwhelmed the Crawfords. After three consecutive years of operating in the red, the board of directors decreed that the only way to make the railroad profitable was to reach the coal fields surrounding Sanding Stone. At the same time, a fellow Nashville figure named Jer Baxter had just finished his work in developing tourist attractions atop Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga. This wealthy Nashville native was described in the press as having a relentless and aggressive spirit, 
Working primarily in the South, Baxter had sharpened his business career as an entrepreneur, a law apprentice, president and vice president of two railroads, and a commercial developer. By the time he came back to Nashville, railroading in the South was much more than just trains loading with steamboats. Business seemed to go on indifferently on the surface, but he felt that his city's economic growth was being hindered by a rashes act of political gain within the industry. In the 1870s, the Nashville, Chattanooga, and St. Louis Railway was the largest railroad in the state, with nearly 400 miles of track to its name. Their version of the future anticipated reaching the pivotal gateway city of St. Louis, opening up several new markets and interchange possibilities with western railroads. Before the track could cross the Ohio River, 67% of NC and St. L's stock interest was acquired by the state's other big railroad, the Louisville and Nashville. In one silent swoop, the NC and St. L went from being an independent, profitable railroad to a wholly owned subsidiary of the Kentucky-based corporation. The city of Nashville saw this as a hostile takeover. Employees, Freight customers and citizens were so enraged at the stealth of LNN's transaction and the cowardice of the NC officials who let it happen. In February 1880, one article in the Nashville Banner read, quote, Nashville needs two or three new railroads controlled by an antagonist of the Louisville and Nashville monopoly. Louisville has not bought the road. She has but little interest in it. New York owns not only the Nashville and Chattanooga, but the l &N Road. Likewise, however, Louisville may frog-like puff and strut. Despite the very real threat of l &N property being destroyed by riots, the l &N did not swallow up the NC and St. L's identity. Their board of directors and management team were retained separately from their own, passenger train fares were slightly curtailed, and all company assets locomotives, rolling stock, and structures were made with a style distinct of their own parent road. For all intents and purposes, Nashville appeared as a city served by two separate railroads, but on paper, just one of them could pick who was in charge and how they did business. Baxter was determined to beat the system. On August 25th, 1893, he chartered his first railroad company from scratch. He named it the Tennessee Central Railroad. Is to build a railroad through the coal measures of the Cumberland Plateau to the capital of the state and to relieve the people of the state from the blighting effects of a railroad monopoly permeating its entire length and breadth and entrenched especially in its central most populous and richest division by the construction of an independent line of transportation giving access to the great markets of the country and inviting the investment of capital in the development of the state's marvelous and unsurpassed resources. He was very aggressive in his efforts to build this dream of his. As far as personality, that probably had something to do with it. And he did not have the political backing uh, except for very few exceptions, to get the support he needed. That winter, the Nashville and Knoxville Railroad finally made it to the coal fields Crawford had set out to mine eight years prior. On December 7, 1893, the newly incorporated town of Standing Stone was renamed Monterey in honor of the mining company that would supply their job market. Baxter planned for connecting the Nashville and Knoxville's terminus with the rival Cincinnati Southern Route at Emory Gap, located at the floor of the Tennessee Valley to the east. This meant crossing over mountains much higher and steeper than those of the plateau. Crawford had originally intended to build his own route first, but had to revise the charter due to the high cost of steep grades, tight curves, and tall trestles. Three other routes had been proposed and attempted to bridge the gap, but failed. Baxter was not much better prepared. Grading the route began immediately, but amounted to just six miles. In the ensuing financial panic that plunged the nation into a depression and dozens of railroads into bankruptcy, sympathizing investors became scarce. 
By April of 1895, the work sputtered to a stop and his contractors succumbed, taking Baxter's investment with them. The company went into receivership and Baxter was removed as president. A receiver named C.O. Godfrey was appointed to reorganize the company's debt, which was impossible with an unfinished railroad with no source of revenue. With a large sum of his own fortune sunk and a signed agreement to interchange freight with the Nashville and Knoxville, Baxter was not going to concede defeat. On his own expense, he moved to St. Louis to search for financial backing from potential allies. As the railroad capital of the country, there was sure to be someone there who would extend him a line of credit, just enough to save the Tennessee Central. Simultaneously, the Nashville and Knoxville announced they would proceed with their plans to not only extend to Nashville, but also extend eastward to connect with the Cincinnati Southern via coal and oil fields in Fentress County. Even with a solid contract for mining and delivering coal, deficits were becoming a normal trend. As the Nashville and Knoxville floundered, the bankruptcy court decreed that there was no feasible way to reorganize the stillborn Tennessee Central Railroad, and soon placed it at auction to the highest bidder. With impeccable timing, Baxter arrived home from St. Louis with four new friends and more than enough money to charter a new company. The Tennessee Central Railway began life on June 14, 1897 completely independent from the first variation, with Baxter serving as president. The new company purchased the old one's assets on its tenth day, and promptly began clearing land and laying track, granting a better start at building from Emory Gap. The grade through Walden's Ridge measured between 1.5 and 2% for most of the ascent, and even warranted the railroad's one and only tunnel at 722 feet long. Several trestles spanned the deep gorges and valleys. Some were built out of wood and others were assembled in steel sections. The tallest trestle carried trains 117 feet above the Piney Creek, near the settlement of Westill. In its westward wake, tiny flag stops flourished into places of industry, as the railroad granted better access to markets along the rugged mountains. The crest of the grade at Dripping Springs was at 2,028 feet above sea level. This marked the highest point on the whole railroad. In September of 1898, rails finally stretched from the Cincinnati Southern in Emory Gap to the N and K in Monterey. At over 50 miles in length, the Tennessee Central Railway was no longer just a short line. As the first train arrived in Monterey, it brought with it the option to interchange with the N and K to continue to Lebanon. Another train change to the NCN St. L could get passengers and freight to Nashville. At long last, the two cities were connected by over 150 miles of steel rails. With the new route in service and generating revenue, Baxter was ready to face the hardest hurdle of building his empire, the Nashville route. Any obstructions that lied ahead were faced not in terrain, nor climate, but in print. In the newly amended charter, its easternmost point was set at the industrial magnet location of Harriman, just two and a half miles east of Emory Gap. If the TC could connect with the Southern Railway, direct access to Knoxville would be secured with trackage rights. Also outlined was a new terminus, 60 miles northwest of Nashville, in Kentucky, the Illinois Central had just acquired the route to Hopkinsville, with steadfast rumors of an extension to Clarksville. Logistics would be set in motion for when the biggest piece of the puzzle was in place. With the Nashville and Knoxville still not showing a profit, the Crawfords and their shareholders wanted out of the old company. A lease was agreed upon for Baxter to control the N and K, but on the condition that the Tennessee Central trains would be rolling into Nashville. With this goal in sight, Baxter would be within 30 miles of bringing rails to Nashville independently from the l and induced monopoly. He had the backing of the Nashville Chamber of Commerce and various freight customers in Davison County and the surrounding area, but not senior managers from the two railroads. Verbal skirmishes were unleashed between Baxter and the presidents of the l and and NC and St. L. l and Milton Smith particularly accused Baxter of, quote, 
trying to dispose of property to the LNN a few years earlier while in receivership. Baxter had several offers to the NC and St. L for their Lebanon branch, and all were promptly rebuffed. It became clear that the only option to reach Nashville was for Baxter to build his own route. This was justifiable to him, as there was still one grand venue for the TC to enter. On October 9, 1900, Nashville's passenger trains arrived and departed under one roof. Union Station was dedicated and open to the public following a ceremony with speeches from prominent Nashville figures. The NC and St. L's Major Thomas spoke about the benefits of having just the combined company occupying the station. City Mayor James Marshall Head, in the presence of Milton Smith, blindsided both of them. Let us hope that these public-spirited men who have put their money in the enterprise will be big enough and broad enough to come to look upon Nashville not as a lemon to be squeezed, nor even as a rich harvest to be gathered, but as a fertile field to be cared for and cultivated. Let us hope that these terminal advantages, erected for the benefit and accommodation of the public, may be used to still further accommodate the public. And when other railroads come knocking for admission at our gates, the doors will be thrown wide open for all comers, upon the payment of such liberal compensation as may be reasonable. Any form of negotiations with the railroads would take time, but Baxter couldn't wait to get the new line built. The Nashville terminus was set up next to the Cumberland River, on the corner of Broad and Front Street. Plans also called for the main line to be extended between Front Street and the river, but this idea was abandoned by city ordinances and geographical shortcomings. This part of the line was built and then leased to the TC by another of Baxter's prior ventures, the Nashville Terminal Company. This company was set up in 1894 to organize passenger and freight transfers within the city, in the days when the two big railroads terminal facilities were still scattered. Baxter was snubbed when they worked in unison against him, but the charter was still valid. If this trackage was built under TC's name, construction would have been delayed for several months for logistical reasons. The Nashville Terminal Company had the infrastructure completed by early 1902 and stretched as far as the city limits. The route to Lebanon was carried out by the Tennessee Construction Company, a paper outfit created for tax reasons to oversee construction with local contractors. In all, there were up to four companies with a common founder building the railroad together. The Nashville and Knoxville would be merged into the system, creating a unified route under the Tennessee Central's name, just in time for construction to wind down in May. Compared to the topology faced in the Cumberland Plateau, Brotherton Mountain, and Walden's Ridge, the 32 miles between Nashville and Lebanon would be some of the least stressful parts of the journey. On May 27, 1902, the first TC train to Nashville departed Lebanon, carrying Jer Baxter and his supportive team of financiers, politicians, and businessmen. Mount Juliet, the special ran parallel to the Lebanon branch and found itself catching up with a westbound NC and St. L train. The spirit of competition turned the run into a race, and the NC engineer pulled ahead. The TC engineer just whistled his farewell and leaned back. After the run, he was reported to have said, You've got the lead, but I've got you bottled in. At two o'clock that afternoon, the special pulled into Nashville, greeted by a parade, grand banquet, and thousands of citizens. Speeches from politicians, businessmen, and Jer Baxter all painted the picture of what was to come. The battle is over. The victory has been won. It is not my intention to hoard over a fallen foe. My motto has been and is in the undertaking of any enterprise, Start at once, fear nothing, and go ahead. The Tennessee Central is heading the charge of progress for Nashville. The 40 years of gloom that have hung over the city like a dark cloud has now passed away. Our boys will cease to go west to seek their fortunes, but will find opportunity and enterprise right here at home. 
For local Nashville politicians, the occasion felt like an act of revenge against the LNN for their transgressions on the NC and St. L 22 years before. The NC and St. L announced the following month that TC had voided its old operating contract and discontinued interchanging freight cars with the route. Unlike the NC and St. L, however, the highest rank of authority on the Tennessee Central would be headquartered not out of state, but here at home, in Nashville's public square. The railroad commenced service on June 2nd. Just three days after the first train arrived in Nashville, Jer Baxter entered a contract with the Tennessee Construction Company to build the route to Clarksville. Illinois Central still did not show any interest in extending south from Hopkinsville, but Baxter insisted on being ready. Because a route through downtown was not feasible, the track was laid on a circuitous path around the southern city limits. This so-called belt line turned south from the main freight yard and weaved under, over, and at grade with the Class 1 railroads and three streetcar lines. Two spur tracks split off to serve freight customers, while the main line headed for the Cumberland River via the swing bridge. The structure was built on a moving pedestal which allowed the bridge to be swung open for maritime traffic. It would be closed only for trains to cross. Baxter elected to build along the Cumberland River as opposed to spending more money on crossing the towering ridges. As the right-of-way connected the towns of White's Bend and Ashland City, it soon became clear that the Illinois Central was not moving from where it was. Another charter revision was in order, permitting construction into Kentucky. The work crew employed 1,500 men to lay track. These men doubled that fall as construction workers had three work crews building towards each other. Hopkinsville businessmen pledged $10,000 for the route's construction, while Illinois Central allowed for the use of their facilities at $89.90 a month as a temporary means until TC could build facilities of their own. Back in Nashville, the Tennessee Central was settling into its role of sending passengers and freight eastward. A diverse timetable of passenger trains covered the route, taking up to six hours to travel from Nashville to Emory Gap. By comparison, it would take at least four hours to take the NC and St. L to Chattanooga, followed by a layover, then change to the Southern for a ride of at least three hours long to Emory Gap, all of which added an additional 46 miles. Dozens of sidings sprawled out from the freight station to customers on city streets, Business owners were soon asking Baxter if the spur on Front Street could be extended to reach their sites on Union Street just a few blocks further. In mid-January 1903, Baxter gave the order for the spur to be extended. The foreman overseeing the project elected to do this at night to cause the least amount of disruption to traffic, but he neglected to notify the city officials about his intentions. On the night of January 20th, 1903, 16 laborers began setting down tracks literally on top of the street. In a flash, traffic jammed up with angry pedestrians and drivers. When police halted the work just before midnight, the rails reached Union Street. What became known as the Midnight Raid gave the impression that Baxter was still trying to send the main line through the city, despite much of the southerly belt line already in place. Even with the irritation of how this event unfolded, the city allowed the trackage to stay, but it had to be buried in Front Street like the rest of the sidings. By now, the opposition from the LNN and the NC and St. L were at all-time highs, with some of it reserved just for Baxter. He reasoned that by stepping down, the conglomerate would treat the TC with less hostility. Rumors persisted that after completion, the Tennessee Central would be snatched up by a competing Class 1 railroad. But Baxter insisted that his railroad would always be independent, as its stocks were deposited in Nashville's Union Bank and Trust, with the added stipulation that the bank would vote against any stock sale that would yield controlling interest. This was among the first of so-called poison pill defenses to discourage hostile takeovers. St. Louis financer J.C. Van Blaircom would succeed Baxter as president, but Baxter was not leaving the railroad scene by any means. He ran for Senate and won. In legislation, he pushed for a bill that would force the LNN to open up Union Station for TC. Out west, construction on the Western Division had most of its infrastructure in place by that summer. Compared to the mountains in the east, 
Track laying in the west was faced more with logistical obstacles thanks to stubborn landowners. The last spike was driven on October 20th, 1903 in a field near Oak Grove, Kentucky. Revenue service gradually came to life northward, with the first passenger train reaching Hopkinsville on November 29th. With the easternmost connection in Harriman opened, the Tennessee Central Railway Company reached its apex. At 296 miles in length, the Nashville route connected three Class I railroads across two states. The Crawford branch split off from the main route in Monterey and delved deep into the coal fields of Fentress and Overton counties. Isseline, Crawford, Wilder, and Davidson became places of industry and a source of untold wealth for the railroad in coming years. Giving open access for the less fortunate would be laced with unfortunate events. Shortly after opening, a flood took the Canny Fork Bridge out of service and split the route in half until a new span could be built. Then, on New Year's Eve 1903, a fire erupted in Southern Junction Yard and destroyed much of the buildings, costing the railroad nearly $350,000. And then, tragedy on a more personal level struck when Jer Baxter suddenly died on February 29th, 1904. So he never really got to see his dream come true. Um, I'm not sure when the decision was made not to go on into Knoxville and to work with the Southern on operating agreement, but I think that was a major mistake. I believe that was after his time. Until his last breath, Baxter had been campaigning to bring the TC to Union Station. In the end, he simply lacked the financial power to persuade the two railroads, who would go on to be the sole tenants of the building. Although expansion on the TC had stopped, his impact was felt where the rails of his company ran. His service would be commemorated with the town of Meinlich being renamed in his honor. A statue was erected and displayed at the intersection of Broadway and West End. He now stands in front of a public middle school he is named after. The future of the Tennessee Central looked as hilly as the land they covered. Like most railroads at this time, the company had sold millions of dollars in bonds to investors to cover construction costs. As long as the railroad paid the interest, investors were happy. Yet not all shippers made the switch out of the monopoly as Baxter had hoped, and the fires at Southern Junction Yard had depleted the railroad of its earnings. The prospect of being snatched up by its own competition became increasingly probable to the point of realization. On July 1st, 1905, both the Illinois Central and the Southern Railway were granted a three-year lease on the eastern and western halves of the railroad. They were given the option to renew after three years or purchase their segments outright. Neither companies turned a profit and declined to buy at the end of this period. During this time, TC welcomed aboard two new interchange partners. First came the Overton County Railroad, which stretched 19 miles from Allgood to Livingston. Its main commodities were logs and poultry, which the TC picked up and sent to Harriman for distribution in the Northeast. The Nashville and Franklin Interurban connected with the Beltline at Vine Hill, and stretched 30 miles south to Franklin, where another railroad connected to Mount Pleasant. The Interurban, as it was called, was primarily a passenger carrier, but the connecting Middle Tennessee Railroad sent freight via the NNF to be forwarded to the TC, as it was cheaper to ship rather than the LNN. The Tennessee Central soon resumed its independent status under new management, which seemed to change hands year by year. Revenues were up to nearly 1.5 million by 1910, but deductions from company expenses, taxes, shareholder costs, and bond payments to the Standard Trust Company all put the line at $265,000 in the red. By 1912, the loss was doubled, and the TC slipped into receivership again. Two receivers were given three years to make a profit. Freight car repairs were expedited, structures were given facelifts, and two and a half miles worth of trestles were filled in with dirt. The line would be carrying more trains as coal traffic from the Crawford and Isseline branches contributed to 29% of the road's traffic, with ever-increasing tonnage by the year. 
On the Western Division, there were plans to extend westward to Paducah and over the Ohio River to the coal fields at Shawneetown, Illinois. TC was prepared to build whenever financing became available, which never did. By 1916, even with the upswing in coal movement, interest payments now spiked the railroad's debt to $2 million, which otherwise could have spared a profit close to $200,000. This property has never been a success, and there does not appear to be much possibility of developing enough volume of tonnage to make it really profitable. Possibly, with a radical scaling down of capital and far lower fixed charges, it might develop into a modestly successful enterprise. A bankruptcy judge ruled out reorganization and ordered for the company to be put up for a foreclosure sale. Offered at auction five times throughout 1917, no bidders came forward to buy the company. Bondholders elected to hold off on the sale until summer of 1918. That was when all of the country's railroads were seized under the control of the United States Railroad Administration. This was the federal government's answer to effectively move materials needed for the Great War taking place overseas. With all of the resources the TC could get, locomotives were leased in the short term from roads TC connected with, with more motive power coming from the Gulf Mobile in Ohio and the Norfolk and Western. The TC began running two passenger trains a day with the IC between Nashville and Princeton, Kentucky, picking up new freight customers for the rest of the route. DuPont set up a new gunpowder plant near Old Hickory, and both the TC and the NC and St. L worked side by side to bring raw materials in and the finished gunpowder out. This was one of the very few times where TC worked alongside a competitor. The TC emerged from government control worse for wear and still financially challenged. Falling further behind on bond payments, the TC was placed for foreclosure sale a second time in June of 1921 for the price of $2 million. By December of that year, the bid was down to $1.5 million, when a business syndicate finally stepped forward. Paul M. Davis and his business group were the sole bidder who won the auction the following January. The Tennessee Central Railroad Company, started by Jer Baxter in 1897, ceased to exist. The $12 million owed by the railroad was written off and the stockholders never saw a return of their investment. Into the frame stepped the newly chartered Tennessee Central Railway Company. The name was so well established it was decided to pick up right where the old road left off. The two receivers had moved on prior to the sale, leaving a Virginian left as the highest authority of the old company. Hugh Wright Stanley joined in 1917 as a receiver with 30 years of railroad experience. He was to report to the Guaranteed Trust Company on the road's reorganization, which Stanley predicted would only take six months. When the Great War started, he was asked by the USRA to stay on board to ensure the railroad functioned properly. Even when independent operations resumed, Stanley remained to ease the line's financial burdens. He came to know every aspect of the old TC's day-to-day -day life, and even knew the whole workforce by name. He insisted that every passenger and freight customer should be treated with respect and courtesy, which would contribute to good service. It didn't take long to decide who would be the president of the new company. Under Stanley's guidance, the Tennessee Central's focus on customer satisfaction earned the company's slogan, the road of personal service. <laughs> Within weeks, new equipment trusts were signed to purchase new locomotives and rolling stock. Coal now made up half of TC's freight tonnage, and 300 new hoppers were on order. The American Locomotive Company, or ALCO, of Schenectady, New York provided six new Mikado-class locomotives, one of the lightest and most nimble of their kind ever built. Compared to their predecessors, they reduced operating costs while hauling up to an additional 10 freight cars on every run. For the first time since 1893, the railroad turned a profit. The total would have been more had it not been for a maintenance employee strike, another fire in Southern Junction Yard, and the closure of several mines playing out of their reserves. Nevertheless, the small dividend paid to the shareholders was a very nice change, of which more would follow throughout the Roaring Twenties. Under 
new management, the TC took up an expansion phase without laying any new track. In Old Hickory, the DuPont gunpowder plant had served its purpose, and the government put the branch line up for sale. The NC and St. L declined, the TC accepted. The whole line passed into their ownership just in time for a new fiber silk plant to open where the old gunpowder plant once stood. As other industries joined in, this simple transaction would greatly benefit the TC's viability for the future. Freight traffic increased in 1923 as more coal tonnage plied the rails, but passenger traffic was decreasing by the year due to conditions outside of any railroad's control. The automobile was now encroaching on newly paved roads into many communities once reachable by the railroad. Management quoted a monthly loss of $2,800 and began trimming the timetable as they saw fit. Despite this, they pressed for upgrading. New acquisitions included the smallest 482 mountain-type locomotives ever built, and the TC's only passenger cars made from steel. Some of the depots were remodeled, and new ones were built in Crossville and Watertown. Those who were still riding got the courteous and helpful service that Stanley enforced. They were usually on time, they were clean, well-maintained, they weren't very modern. Matter of fact, none of them had air conditioning. They put a lot of people straight in the same car. You get to a certain station like Cookville, Monterey or somewhere, they'd unload what from outside and take it on to the next place. When I was in grammar school, my grandfather had a close friend who was on the Tennessee Central Board. And he had a granddaughter who didn't go to school with the rest of us. And I mean, we were all a little gang that had been together since kindergarten, and she went to a different school, and he was anxious for her to meet some of his friend's grandchildren, just like happens today, <laughs> same old story. Got the, uh, the, the Tennessee Central private car and took me and a friend of mine and the granddaughter and a friend of hers. And we set off from the station, and went up on the plateau and spent the weekend. And it was fun. Nineteen twenty nine ended as the company's most profitable year, but with the stock market crash on October twenty ninth, the first deficit was to hit in two years. The Great Depression's impact was negligible at first, which accumulated in discontinuing passenger service to Hopkinsville, but soon escalated to drop in revenue by twenty eight percent. By cost-cutting wherever the company could, including maintenance, the loss in 1932 came just over $82,000. In 1933, some of the shuttered mines resumed production and contributed to a modest increase in freight traffic, which continued the following year. Incredibly, passenger ridership was up by 52%, which paved the way for a small profit, the first one in the decade. With the resumption of select maintenance expenditures and profits to be earned through the rest of the decade, a route that was barely economically viable in nationwide boom times had survived the worst economic downturn in modern history. Other lines were not so lucky. The Overton County Railroad, now known as the Tennessee, Kentucky, and Northern, was suffering greatly from the loss dealt by the Depression. Its service between Livingston and the TC connection in Allgood was discontinued in April of 1934. The route that started it all, the Lebanon branch of the NC and St. L, carried its last train on the night of July 13, 1935. The Tennessee Central had the advantage of being routed through Lebanon instead of terminating, and the freight customers gradually made the switch. The branch's trackage within the city was sold to the TC, and the remaining trackage was paved over to form Leeville Pike. Automobiles were now cruising on government-subsidized roadways into the towns the railroads served, but passenger patronage on the TC seemed to level off as if the line was holding its own. At grade crossings, though, there were no contests. <laughs> Collisions between locomotives and cars were on the rise, so the railroad sought to minimize the risk by upgrading crossing signals and by grade separating road from the rail wherever possible. Nashville was beset with a different problem. 
Coal-fired locomotives that rolled through day in and day out created what seemed to be a permanent sooty haze around the city. With smog ordinances in effect for downtown, the TC made their mark on December 3rd, 1939. Number 50. Their first ever diesel electric locomotive was the first of its kind to operate in Nashville. It was tasked with switching freight cars in Southern Junction Yard and along Front Avenue in downtown. A second diesel would be ordered two years later. For two years, it was possible to see all three forms of motive power roaming within the Music City, with diesel electric switchers on the TC and electric inner urbans on the Nashville and Franklin, which would be phased out in 1941. Everything else would be steam powered for the time being. Locomotives on the TC were to be maintained in tip top condition for moving over 1 million tons of coal in 1940, over half of the road's commodities. Freight tonnage jumped ahead the following year as the Tennessee Valley Authority tasked the railroad to move materials to dam countless rivers throughout the state. As prosperous as the TC was when it came to upgrading itself, it never allocated funds for strengthening the wooden trestles that had now stood for 40 years. Most of the TC's locomotives had to be built just light enough to tread over these trestles, while heavier engines that could pull more tonnage were running on limited range. Yet compared to how grandiose motive power had become on railroads TC connected with, it was clear which railroad was better equipped for moving tons of freight at speed. In light of world events at this time, the chief engineer wrote to the line's supervisor of bridges that the trestles on the Western Division should be strengthened to accommodate heavier locomotives. His recommendation was never carried out. Following Pearl Harbor and the subsequent entrance into World War II, this line was to be the center of TC's wartime activity. Much of the war-related supplies was carried to the new Army training base located near the Kentucky border. Camp Campbell was well within easy reach of the Western Division, and the TC was quick to make an interchange agreement with the Army. Reportedly, the LNN tried to intervene by reactivating an abandoned branch line from Gracie. The TC retaliated by appealing to the Interstate Commerce Commission. From July 16, 1941, the later incorporated Fort Campbell would do their rail business solely with the TC. Throughout the war, the railroad would suffer through two major derailments, a locomotive boiler explosion, and a freight house burning. Yet the employees worked as many as seven days a week for months on end. By 1943, passenger revenue had increased by 141%, most of them bound for Camp Campbell. Moving these passengers and occupying freight called for more motive power. The steep grades and lengthened trains made doubling the hill time consuming. For the spindly wood trestles on the Western Division, a group of former Illinois Central Pacifics were just light enough to move troops and supplies to Camp Campbell. Bridges on the Eastern Division were reinforced for the coming of larger locomotives to carry TC's name. Four articulated steam locomotives were purchased from the Norfolk and Western Railroad, each weighing a hundred tons more than a normal locomotive. They came with twelve driving wheels mounted on a hinged frame which bent in the middle to go around curves. Despite having as much flexibility as a normal locomotive and with twice the pulling power, doubling up was not completely eliminated. They did help move more traffic smoothly, which contributed to the TC's most profitable wartime year of service. When the war finally ended in 1945, the railroad had been in overdrive for so long that the economic slowdown temporarily knocked the road out of shape. This was quickly rectified in just a few short years thanks in no small part to their new owners. On June 20th, 1946, stock was sold off by Paul Davis, who had led the syndicate from its inception in 1922. The buyer was an investment firm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, headed by J. Lewis Armstrong. He was among many investors who observed how well the TC performed during the war and the many promises that lay ahead for the future. In light of the new ownership, Hugh Wright Stanley was removed as president, as Lewis's management was ushered in. Stanley was asked to return to his post less than a year later. 
Back in office, Stanley began studying ways of reducing redundant costs, starting with motive power. The first post-war diesel locomotives to arrive were three road switchers built by Baldwin, the first of their kind in operation, and were put to work on the Western Division. Soon afterwards, a relationship was kindled with the American Locomotive Company, who delivered the TC's only streamlined locomotives, the F.A. class. Despite their high purchase price, the F.A.'s and the Baldwins were proving to be lighter, more effective, and cheaper to operate than the coal-fired alternative. As more of these units sidelined steam, annual expenses for locomotive maintenance dropped by 18%. Finances improved by such a margin that the damage from another fire in Monterey was brushed off with just the insurance. With the subsequent discontinuance of the sparsely used Pullman service, the Tennessee Central was back in the black. The greatest promise of prosperity was a grand proposal from the TVA, the Kingston Steam Plant. This new power station was set up on the banks of the Emory River, well within reach from TC's yard in Emory Gap. It was forecast to use up to 300 coal hoppers every day, with shipments coming in by barge and by rail. The TC and the Southern Railway were the primary rail carriers enlisted. Company officials reckoned that with the right price, coal mined on the TC could be utilized at other TVA plants throughout the southeast. It seemed like a boom was imminent. But the TC was unprepared. There was not enough locomotives and rolling stock to service the potential boom, and the existing coal mines could be quickly depleted. By request from the TVA, new trackage was laid around Monterey to locations where coal seams could open. As for rolling stock, an appeal was made to the government-operated Reconstruction Finance Corporation for a loan of $2.2 million. With this money, Four locomotives from Schenectady, New York, and 200 coal hoppers from Bessemer, Alabama were acquired. By 1953, the dieselization allowed for the retirement of the last remaining steam locomotives from the roster. The transition to diesel eyes moved so fast that none of Tennessee Central's steam locomotives were spared from the scrapper's torch. At a time when historic preservation was in its infancy, there was little room for such sentiment in embracing the future. Their corporate neighbors would follow suit, with Illinois Central keeping steam rolling through Hopkinsville as late as 1960. With the last remaining furnaces and heaters converted to oil, TC had completely eliminated its dependence on coal as a fuel source. Coal shipments to the TVA Kingston Steam Plant began in February of 1954 and accumulated to almost 1 million tons delivered, paving the way for a massive profit that was hit by the recession after the Korean War. Regardless of outside conditions, the railroad now had to begin the process of paying off its loans to the RFC, a process that would last 13 years. The biggest news of all that year was the departure of the man who brought the company to this exact moment in time. President Hugh Wright Stanley retired on March 23, 1954. The last time I talked to Mr. Stanley, he called me in his private car and gave me a 35-year service book. 35 years loyal and faithful service. Mr. Stanley was, I'd say, a brilliant businessman as well as a very effective politician. And I think he truly cared about the railroad. He would often go out on the line and, and talk to the people working on the track and so on. He was, he was a well-loved president of the railroad, which I cannot say about all of them had. <laughs> Hugh Wright Stanley, hailed as the Dean of Railroad Shortline Presidents, left the Tennessee Central Railway Company as its longest serving president. Stanley passed away a month later. There would be no more Nashvillian control from now on. Former railroad president Earl Keister Jr. was appointed by Armstrong to oversee the entire operation. By now, a law firm in Philadelphia handled all of the legal business, replacing local enforcement that had been working since day one. Only four out of the eleven directors were native to the region, and all answered to their landlords in the Northeast. This refocusing of power seemed innocent at the time, but there would be other factors coming into play that the TC would have to face. 
Keister's first order of business was the fate of the two remaining passenger trains. With the spreading of paved roads and highways akin to kudzu, the turn dwindled down to as little as three cars with no more than a dozen riders. When the mail contract was dropped in favor of trucking, expenses increased faster than the rolling stock's repair deficits. The railroad won permission from the ICC to discontinue the train amidst some opposition. The last round trip left Nashville on July 31, 1955. The four cars were packed to capacity in both directions. Coal traffic was still on the rise, with shipments to Kingston moving along with 1.5 million tons generating over $1 million in revenue. There was even an increase in carload traffic when the l &N and the NC and St. L were hit by employee strikes and shippers discovered how efficiently the TC moved their products. A new steel mill in Rockwood was served by the TC and the Southern, contributing even more revenue. By 1956, the service was up by 3.5 million tons of freight and a profit of $278,069, both of which were all-time records. Armstrong believed the best was yet to come. Another appeal was made to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and the TC was granted a $3 million loan to be paid back in five years. This loan brought two new locomotives and 61 second-hand hoppers to move 1.5 million tons of coal. The following year, the amount of coal totaled a 15% decrease. As it turned out, coal mined in eastern Kentucky from the mines served by the l and and the Southern had a much lower sulfur content than of the Cumberland Plateau. The TC was granted short-term contracts to move their coal, some of which were not renewed after their two-year stint. Although final delivery to the Kingston steam plant took place on TC rails, the resulting compensation was much less than their own coal. Add the rising cost of labor and supplies, and the deficits of 1957 came to nearly $100,000 in the red. By the end of the decade, the president's seat changed hands, and hardly 2.5 million tons of freight were moved with deficits posted all the way. The Tennessee Central Railway Company was not the only railroad having trouble. Nationwide shifts in transportation left even the largest and most profitable railroads fending for themselves. On August 30th, 1957, the NC and St. L was merged into the l &N. Labor unions and shippers opposed the union, but the deal seemed to go unnoticed by the public. Airlines began carrying more passengers than trains, with jet service on its way to Nashville's Berry Field. The Interstate Highway Act was initiated just the previous year and was already spreading across the continent. Interstate 65 would be the first of the massive roadway network to reach Nashville, with planned Interstates 40 and 24 proposed to run parallel to the TC's right-of-way. Freight revenues were projected to plummet precipitously. The interstate even threatened to pave over TC's route. The state pressured the railroad to give up its belt line to build a bypass around the city. Because this would split the railroad in half, TC wouldn't go along without a compromise. Two options were pitched by the state. Either swing onto l and trackage rights between Vine Hill and 19th Street, or build a new route between Front Street and the Cumberland River to where an industrial spur connected at Harrison Street. The company favored the latter alignment, but begrudgingly settled for l and trackage rights at $1.5 million. Fortunately for TC, landowner disputes would delay actual deconstruction for the time being. All the while, the railroad did its best to make ends meet. The RFC loans taken out in the previous decade were now totaling up to $5 million, all due to be repaid on April 1st, 1960. After presenting the evidence to the government, the deadline was pushed back by seven years. The company urgently needed to reverse its deficit trends by then, with the expected interest rate increase to be paid up front. The Tennessee Central had been so dependent on coal as its primary commodity that the line had hardly considered specializing in any other goods. One method railroads were using to win back revenue was piggyback, or trailer on flat car service. Carrying truck trailers by rail with consumer goods made for good profitability as long as the service competed effectively with the roadways. However, 
with the route's 30 mile per hour speed limit, TOFC service did not reverse the downward trend. On the old Hickory branch, DuPont closed their aging facilities. It would be quite a while before new industries would spring up, with the uncertainty of whether or not they would even ship by rail. In May of 1965 came the greatest hit of all. The Clinchfield Coal Company closed the mines on the railroad's routes. An increase in miners' wages and decline in the price for shipment to TVA ultimately deterred Clinchfield from renewing its contracts. Crawford, Wilder, Davidson, and Isseline all lost their primary commodity, and the company lost its largest source of business forever. With deficits at all-time highs and President Leo Nielsen's subsequent resignation, the TC moved to reorganize its sales force to attract new customers. This was partially successful with a 5% traffic increase that allowed for new motive power to spare the worn-out fleet. By September, the power scramble was resolved with Nashville businessman William Watkins Glenn. Passenger excursions were operated on behalf of the local chapter of the National Railroad Historical Society and were a tremendous success. The very first one that I recall was run by uh, Tennessee Historical Society and it was a charter to Monterey. And I was fortunate to be on it. Went up there and had L N coaches. Of course, they were air conditioned. We had quite a few to Monterey, some to Carthage Junction, some to Harriman, all the way, providing a chance for a lot of school kids to ride trains that never had. At a time when passenger rail travel was in an overall state of decline, these fan trips served more as public outreach for people who had become disconnected with the industry. They were among the few passenger trains the TC turned a profit on, with carloads of corporate goodwill going to its guests. While the company was not what it was a decade prior, those who earned their living on the TC had their pride instilled many decades before. My father worked on the railroad. My grandfather worked on the railroad for the Tennessee Central. All my uncles worked for the Tennessee Central. Uh, it was a very important part of my life. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, restriction on the East End, so as a, as a child and as a young man, uh, I got to uh, ride in the engine with my father uh, quite often. The men from this area that worked on the TC that weren't my relatives were, were close friends of my father and uh, in later years became close friends of mine. My father-in-law at that time was a uh, car knocker on the Tennessee Central, and um, he told me about uh, they were hiring operators, a couple of operators was going to be hired, and uh, I had not ever had any interest in the railroad, but I thought, well, what the heck, I'll just hire on, so I did, and uh, that started a, a probably a 38-year career with the railroad. I would uh, carpool with uh, older guys, it was the crews, and, and go to uh, work at uh, like at Emory Gap, working uh, working with uh, with the train crews and, and the track people and bridge people, uh, even uh, camp cars when they would be in a, a station, maybe working on bridges close by, and uh, going and eat with them, eat with the crews were there. Some stayed in the camp cars, so there's just uh, there's a lot of things on the railroad. That, uh, Railroading today is not like. Nineteen sixty seven began with over three hundred thousand dollars in cash and six million dollars in outstanding loans. By July twelfth, over two hundred thousand dollars of that amount had been lost. A board of directors meeting that month decreed that any possible method of salvation had to be explored, even bankruptcy. J.L. Armstrong resigned as chairman on July 5th. A group of Nashville businessmen offered to buy his controlling interest, but they couldn't come up with the $750,000 needed to claim majority ownership. While still under Armstrong's control, everything that could be cut to save money was cut, including maintenance. 
As a consequence, derailments became more frequent to the point of negating any theoretical savings. The hardest hit of them all was at Carthage Junction, where Train 84's loose load of lumber hit a switch stand and caused a stringline effect that sent the first few cars and one locomotive into the Hickman Creek. <laughs> No one was injured, but the damages were just partially insured. With no clear direction on what to do next, Len decided to contact an old foe. The old bitterness of railroad rivalries from the turn of the century had faded by 1967. Many of them were in the same yard of mounting deficits and loss of traffic, and the l &N had interest in keeping the route open with 1,000 cars interchanged each month. Glenn wrote to the accounting, mechanical, and operating departments of their old foe to assess his railroad and estimate how much they could help. The l &N responded that savings of $50,000 annually could be achieved if locomotive and freight car repairs were done on their watch in nearby Radnor Yard. All of the TC's shop employees would be taken under l &N's wing while the TC would cover just the repair and overtime costs. It also would reduce the number of trains operated, which were deemed excessive and discontinuances could amount to sizable savings annually. On December 12th, Glenn wrote back to LNN's VP of Operations to ink the deal, urging that the agreement took place as soon as possible. The negotiations never happened. $1.6 million were lost. $8.9 million were due in full payment to the government. Illinois Central had published a tariff that forbade interchanging of freight cars unless charges were paid in advance. Vendors were preparing to file suit to collect their payments. The U.S. Treasury turned down another deadline extension. The company had operated in the red for eight consecutive years. Two days later, there was only one thing left to do. Declare bankruptcy. U.S. District Judge William E. Miller was appointed to oversee the bankruptcy petition. Nashville businessman A. Battle Rhodes was appointed as receiver. They took to the job with the goal of returning the railroad to profitability. Rhodes soon discovered what had already been proven as fact. TC was losing $125,000 every month, burdened by the RFC loans and competition from the interstates. Reducing trains and laying off employees entailed renegotiating labor contracts, which simply was not feasible. In February of 1968, Rhodes filed an abandonment petition with the ICC. Only then did the offers of salvation crop up. Shoreline entrepreneur Murray Salzberg offered a loan of $500,000 to Rhodes to buy the whole company and gain a first line of property should the line shut down. There were too many legal challenges to ensure viability, which discouraged further development. The state legislature estimated that 6,000 jobs could be lost and proposed that the state purchase the entire railroad and then lease it to a qualified operator. It was approved in the House by a large margin, but was vetoed by Governor Buford Ellington, a former l &N vice president. He had been advised that such a transaction was unconstitutional. In March, fortunes were literally hit hard. Descending Brotherton Mountain, Train 81 was struck by a rock slide, crushing two locomotives. No one was injured, but many feared that the line would be shut down then and there. The ICC did not rule on the abandonment petition, and the mess was cleared up. Rhodes began negotiating with the l &N to oversee the day-to-day -day operations. They were more interested in operating unspecified portions of the TC in the event the line shut down. This was bitterly opposed by labor unions and shippers even after the abandonment petition was approved on April 30th. On May 22nd, Rhodes appeared before Judge Miller and proclaimed that not only had no buyer been found, but accountants were scrambling to rearrange funds just to make payroll. Rhodes asked Judge Miller to shut the railroad down. Within days of the announcement, the three railroads that TC connected with began posting bids for sections of the track they favored. Miller scheduled hearings throughout the summer to consider bids while Rhodes kept the railroad running until something was settled on. 
The hearings were laced with offers and counteroffers about what trackage belonged to them and how the former TC employees could fit in. Being an employee, we, of course, we didn't hear uh, things here and there. At that time, uh, I was uh, the agent at Crabble, Tennessee, during that summer, and I couldn't tell much different uh, other than I was hopeful that the TC would keep operating. Illinois Central was putting up $2 million for the entire route between Hopkinsville and Harriman and would not exit any prior labor contracts, which LNN desired. Employees were largely in favor of this plan, but government officials were left skeptical about the condition that the city would pay for a new connector track to replace the paved over belt line. What the LNN's lawyer did, he didn't just say Nashville to Crossville. He said, mile post X to mile post Y. Well, when you look at the map, those mile posts included the shippers. So they got the majority of their own line shippers. <laughs> Debates raged on for hours each day as the LNN and IC struggled to make the best appeal to the judge. Well, a good friend of mine who's a big railroad family with the TC, Bernard Mazzini, he leaned over and whispered to me when they came back from recess. He said, three-way split. I said, no way. He said, you watch it. On August 13th, a three-way split was proposed by Rhodes. The Illinois Central would take the Western Division between Nashville and Hopkinsville, connecting with the LNN at West End. The Southern gained the easternmost segment of the Eastern Division between Harriman and Crossville, and the remaining trackage to the Kingston Steam Plant. That left the middle portion, including most of the branch lines, to the LNN, the railroad that fought so hard all those years ago to prevent the line from entering the city it would call all of the shots for. I was uh, sort of surprised at, at, the, at getting the notice that quick because I thought uh, that maybe things was looking up by them uh, tearing the depot down and putting the trailer there, but then, but then it, it kept evolving and that uh, and looking like they was going to close down, so uh, they put out a letter that uh, they were shutting down on uh, August the 31st. On that uh, Friday, they wanted everybody to uh, in the east end, on the east end, to turn their keys in and moderate. And uh, of course, all the employees uh, at that time had uh, they had told us that we could put in applications with the Southern and the LNN, which I, I did. Judge Miller felt that a better deal could have been reached if the whole route was just one railroad. The Illinois Central proposal was favored the most, but the time taken to decide on the connector track contingency would mean that the TC would keep losing money more than it should. Reluctantly, Judge Miller approved the split and set August 31st, 1968 as the last day of operations. The three railroads promised to take on as many former TC employees as they could, but wouldn't commit to an exact number until operations under the new owners began service. Shippers were given less than two weeks' notice, and an embargo would forbid cars to be interchanged at a certain date. LNN had already cut a deal where TC's best maintained locomotives and rolling stock were purchased and leased back to TC to provide a temporary cash reflex. Some would still operate over TC trackage wearing LNN paint schemes for several years afterwards. At the 11th hour, a last ditch effort was put in by the Metropolitan Nashville Industrial Board. They put forth a $1 million bond for a new route through downtown to connect the two divisions, which could make the railroad whole again. In return, they asked the Illinois Central to resubmit the bid to purchase the whole railroad. On August 31st, 1968, equipment was gathered up in Nashville for the LNN to take possession. The last train to Hopkinsville departed Southern Junction Yard, taking for the last time the Belt Line, soon to be reused as Interstate 440. On arrival in Hopkinsville, the train was left in IC's yard and the crew was driven home. Throughout its whole life, the Tennessee Central was a tenant of the IC's infrastructure never gathering enough capital to build its own facilities. Just three days later, TC's labor unions and IC made an appeal to Judge Miller to sell the entire railroad. He rejected, 
citing continued uncertainty about the public financing of the Northern Lee section. Labor leaders, politicians, and IC management continued to solicit public support to save their railroad, but it was too late. Miller stood by his decision. Although he could have been overruled by the Interstate Commerce Commission, it was reluctant to act. By spring 1969, the three railroads had paid for their segments and began redeveloping the property as they saw fit. The company ceased to exist, and the last parcel of land sold. Like a divided empire, the once unified route took to their separate fates. The Southern continued service for as long as it could on the most scenic portion, until the city of Crossville ordered for their rails to be torn up. The l &N abandoned the segment between Crossville and Monterey, creating a 30-mile gap. The Illinois Central had a change in parent company priorities, which led to the line falling into disrepair eventually severing the link between Ashland City and Fort Campbell. Between the railheads, there remains little evidence that a railroad used to run here. Elsewhere, the legacy of the TC is alive and well. The Southern Railway's portion is operated by La Hoist North America, a mining company based in Crab Orchard. The material is transported down the mountain to Emory Gap for interchange with Norfolk Southern, which also uses the remaining trackage to Harriman as part of their main line. CSX maintains trackage rights on this stretch to reach the Kingston Steam Plant, which is still providing power to the southeast with coal from Kentucky and Wyoming. The Western Division is operated in two sections. The Nashville and Western Railroad is still moving freight between Ashland City and Nashville's West End. Fort Campbell, home of the 101st Airborne Division, maintains the route to Hopkinsville, with a new belt line connecting CSX just below the city. In between these active sections, a six-mile stretch of roadbed just north of Ashland City is now the Cumberland River Bicentennial Trail, a paved recreational path following one of the most scenic portions of the route. The l and middle portion was eventually slated for abandonment east of Old Hickory, when the affected counties banded together. The Nashville and Eastern Railroad came into being on September 15, 1986, purchasing 135 miles of track from l and successor CSX. This new railroad covered the remaining trackage of the TC, including the branches to South Carthage and Old Hickory, and the Beltline to Vine Hill. Service stretched 94 miles to Allgood, with the whole line re-entering service with a sand mine north of Monterey in 2008. The stage was being set for the line to become a host of economic rebirth. In 1989, the Broadway dinner train began running evening dining excursions from the new Riverfront Park to Old Hickory and back. A nonprofit, all volunteer organization was close behind and sponsored excursions of their own, eventually taking over the excursion business. Now, with their own fleet of vintage diesel locomotives and stainless steel passenger cars, the Tennessee Central Railway Museum operates special themed excursions across the entire railroad from Nashville to Monterey with stops in Watertown and Baxter. With nearly 30 years of experience of passenger rail travel at leisure, another nonprofit group is stepping forward to add on to Nashville's heritage in a way unseen in over 60 years. 576 is the last remaining standard gauge steam locomotive from the Nashville, Chattanooga and St. Louis Railway. After sitting on display in Centennial Park for 64 years, the locomotive is now under lease from Metro Nashville Parks by the nonprofit Nashville Steam Preservation Society, which is raising money to relocate, restore, and operate the 576 under its own steam over the rails of its ancestors' rivals. The biggest game changer of all for the railroad began service on September 18, 2006. The Music City Star is the first and only commuter rail service in Tennessee. 
between Nashville and Lebanon, this old route was introduced to right-of-way realignments, continuous welded rail, and centralized traffic control to get the most out of the service. It was the least expensive commuter rail system installation anywhere in, in the United States. Um, and it was an experiment in a way. We didn't think that in 2006 when the star was put in place that Nashville would be booming like it is. So looking for those uh, transit options is, is critical for our future growth. The biggest differences can be seen in Martha where an entirely new right-of-way allows higher speed under and over two highways. Since inauguration, a location formerly comprised of two grade crossings is now home to a lumber yard, a sheet metal plant, a plastics manufacturer, and a ceramics company. All of these industries can ship their products on the Nashville and Eastern, who can interchange the cars with CSX for distribution anywhere in the country. Three miles to the east, the star has spurred economic development to warrant a new station. Hamilton Springs is one of the first transit-oriented planned communities in the nation, and the star runs straight through the middle of the proposed site. So we're repeating history today. Uh, there was already a train station here once, and now we're doing it again, except before, people from Nashville came here to relax. Now hopefully people live here and go to Nashville and relax, so we'll do a little bit backwards, but there was a station here before. Similar developments are being planned at Mount Juliet and Donaldson, which would put the economic centers of the suburbs within walking distance from the railroad tracks. So we are implementing the, the UDO, the Urban Design Overlay, and to create a, a true town center, walkable, mixed-use, civic-anchored town center. And the star in, the, in Donaldson Station is a central piece to that. Um, and we are looking, like as I said before, developing around the station in a more mixed-use capacity that allows for growth, residential growth, commercial growth, and uh, focuses on making that train run more often. In the long term, the star is hoped to reach northward to Clarksville, this would be achieved by relaying much of the right-of-way from Ashland City into Robertson County with a quoted tag of $100 million. As progress moved forward, those who knew what they had did what they could. Document the changes. Some took matters into their own hands and saved historic depots and rolling stock for posterity. Most of these buildings have been repurposed as museums and visitor centers, while others have been rebuilt from the ground up. In Nashville, the Master Mechanics Office houses the Tennessee Central Railway Museum, while the freight car repair shop is now home to an advertising agency. The surviving rolling stock has been scattered to the wind, with some cabooses restored as display pieces. Of the route's locomotive fleet, only two survive. Class S1 Switcher number 51 was sold to the Cades Railroad in Kentucky and operated for over a decade hauling consumer goods. The 51 currently sits on static display under a shelter in Cades. The other survivor, Class C420 number 400, was included in a lease agreement with the LNN. After 10 more years of service, LNN 1316 was retired, sold, rebuilt, and resold. On the Apache Railway, number 82 is still hard at work moving freight in eastern Arizona in the company of other Alco locomotives. For all of the hardships the old Tennessee Central endured, over half of its route is still being used as intended. In places, wood trestles have given way to concrete structures, curves have been straightened out, and the track can now handle twice the tonnage than before. In over a hundred years since it arose, and fifty years since it left, this 19th century mode of travel is still proving its worth in the 21st century economy. But even in recurring boom times, fate finds a loophole. In November of 2013, these rails came under fire once again. There was disagreement between TDOT and the short line rails as far as the, the funding goes and for rail improvements and maintenance and whatnot. And so until that was resolved, uh, those funds were held. But the good news is that thanks to the state legislature, TDOT did release those funds. And um, I, I look forward to seeing so the, the improvements that I know that the Nashville and Eastern Rail definitely need all, all across the line. 
I think that no matter of what transit uh, proposal is put forth, it's got to look at how we grow sustainably over the next uh, decades to come. The star, of course, like I mentioned, is going to be a central piece to that. It's going to showcase how we can create transit-oriented development areas uh, that includes affordable housing, that includes good uh, commercial and, and retail and new restaurants that I know that I've, I've been hearing a lot from my community that, that they want. The, this short line rail, the Nashville and Eastern Rail, is shown to be critical, not just for Nashville and for transit, but as I sit on the Nashville and Eastern Rail Authority board and I listen to the needs of surrounding counties uh, for freight and whatnot, it is a huge economic driver uh, for those counties. And it's, so it's critical that we invest in, in, the, in the rail to continue to uh, ad advance uh, freight um, and, and, tr and transit. So Nashville and Eastern Rail, like I said, is, uh, is, is a critical part to Middle Tennessee's growth. What the Nashville Eastern needs, in my opinion today, is a major shipper like a, an automobile manufacturing plant to locate somewhere on the line east of Lebanon, say Cookville, Crossville, get the track back in. From Nashville to Knoxville is 100 miles closer over the Tennessee Central route than it is to go on the CSX, because they have to go to Chattanooga first and then up think they would be able to locate some major rail shippers on the line. Uh, there's still a lot of coal on the line and the line that went up to Wilder, which most of that branch is gone, could be used and with the scrubbers they got now, they can burn high sulfur coal. But I think there's still a great potential for coal. The east end of the line does have some traffic now, but it's not nearly the traffic it was back in the heyday. Middle Tennessee, the Cookville, Monterey, this area is, is growing by leaps and bounds. And to attract businesses, as we are doing right now, there will come a time when, when there will be more than sand shipped out of here. There will be, there's industry here now. The county's largest employer is uh, here in Monterey. I think as, as time goes on, uh, rail service will be essential. It could be, in my eyes, just like in the old days, everything would be run by rail and then your trucks would be used for, for local distribution. The problem, I think, over the years is with the decline of the railroads and with the line being pulled up, they're just not used to using rail. And their, their whole systems are set up for the trucking industry. As the trucking industry continues to grow, uh, I believe there will be an outcry to uh, bring back more rail service to take the traffic off the, the roadways. It's more economical and less hazardous to transport goods by rail. The future of the Tennessee Central's legacy is still being written to this day. On November 9, 2018, both the Nashville and Eastern and Nashville and Western Railroads were acquired by shortline empire R.J. Corman. Their goal is the continuation of an essential yet overlooked service for the isolated depths of Middle Tennessee, one that has been moving non-stop for over 128 years. Beneath the gauge of these rails, though, are tales not just of the power and glory of this business, but also the headaches and heartaches for those who maintained it. They were engineers, conductors, officers, maintenance of way workers, customers and passengers who all helped to keep their connection to the outside world when the world itself seemed to turn against them. Their participation in this grand adventure is remembered by us as those who served the road of personal service. <laughs>